Hi guys, welcome to my new YouTube channel here. My name is Drew Brashler. I'm an audio engineer with Northridge Community Church, and I'm also a ham radio operator. KD7QCU is my call sign. Today I'm going to be talking about do-it-yourself wireless microphone distribution for the RF side of things. So that's basically taking one antenna, um, multiplying it out to multiple uh, receivers. Um, so uh, just a little bit about me, myself. I'm an audio engineer for Northridge Community Church. Like I said, I've been doing audio since uh, the age of seven with my dad and uh, went to the Conservatory of Recording Arts and Sciences. Uh, so I've really been around audio and systems for quite some time. Um, I'm also amateur radio operator or ham radio as they call it, uh, KD7QCU. Done this for a number of years uh, and electronics and uh, radio frequencies and all of that stuff is definitely uh, one of my big hobbies. Uh, in fact, here's me on uh, one of my ham radio towers that I bought and there's my radio shack right next to it. So um, we're going to be talking about the do-it-yourself wireless microphone distribution. Um, so a couple of the problems that I see uh, in some churches is when you have multiple wireless receivers with two antennas each for the dual diversity, it really gets crowded in a rack. Um, also, you know, most churches um, don't really uh, have the budget for purchasing a factory antenna distribution. Um, and another thing is the stock antennas are omnidirectional, so that means that they bring in uh, RF from everywhere around, just like an omnidirectional mic, it would be bringing in uh, audio from all the way around it. And they have reduced signal strength being close to the metal rack, because all of the metal things that we're putting in a rack are metal, and then they're rack rails are metal. So there's a lot of metal around it. Um, at Northridge, our wireless receivers are at the back of the room, at the front of the house. Um, and so one of the pros of that is it allows for fast troubleshooting. So if something's going wrong with the uh, wireless mic, I can quickly look down, see hey, I'm not getting signal from this microphone, it's possibly battery issue. Uh, another pro is uh, theft possibilities, quite a bit lower. Uh, it's in a locked area. Uh, if it was up on my stage, it would be a lot more accessible to people. And another con is there's a lower signal strength uh, because of the distance that we are away from the stage. So it's about 60 feet uh, from the front of the house to the front of the stage. Um, and so uh, the distance also affects the signal strength of uh, radio signals. So um, let's go ahead and look at wireless frequencies. So this is a chart uh, from the FCC. Um, this is all of the allocations of the frequency spectrum for the United States. Uh, so we're going to specifically go and zoom in here on uh, the TV uh, broadcast broadcasting channels. Um, so specifically, we're going to start looking at the 512 to 608. So this is channels 21 through 36. And then also we have a little um, blip of stuff that we can't use in. And then we jump from 614 up to 698. Um, and then there is one portion beneath 512 that goes down to 470. This is also one area that some wireless microphones will use. So on um, so basically, all of the frequencies that are used in the current wireless systems span from 470 megahertz to 698 megahertz. Uh, and so Shure uh, USA, their frequencies on most of mostly all of their wireless uh, products that they can sell in the U.S. is from 470 to 698. Um, and also Sennheiser is from 516 to 668. Uh, and then, because I know that there's going to be some international viewers out there, I'm going to include the international frequencies used. Uh, so Sennheiser uses 516 to 865. Uh, Shure uses 470 to 806. Uh, and AKG uses 500 to 862. So that pretty much ranges the entire uh, frequency spectrum of wireless microphones that are used. So we have our US frequencies from 470 to 698, and our international from 470 to 862. And so what I'm looking for in a distribution is making sure that it has a bandwidth greater than 470 to 862 megahertz. Um, all right. So next we're going to talk about antennas. So antennas, um, as you can see right here, our antennas are like a microphone to radio frequency. So um, when we are using a kick drum, which is more low frequency, we want to be using a, a larger diaphragm mic like a, a Beta 52 or something that's, that's going to be good for 
for capturing those low frequency notes, uh, whereas you wouldn't want to use a Beta 52 if you were miking, say, a flute, so that's going to be all high frequency stuff. Um, so just like that, um, antennas are built uh, in, to kind of range different uses. Um, so we have uh, omnidirectional and directional antennas. So you can see the omnidirectional is uh, on the right hand side. It's a little dipole, or sorry, a, a little vertical there. And then we have a directional antenna on the left side there. Um, and some antennas are tuned for higher frequencies than others, just like the microphones. You know, one, some are better for kick drums, some are better for, you know, flutes or violins and stuff like that. So the stock antennas that ship with most of all of the uh, wireless microphones uh, is a quarter wave vertical monopole antenna. Uh, it's a very simple design. It is one quarter wavelength of the normal frequency that it's going to be uh, picking up. Uh, it's good for one small set of frequencies. So um, basically, if you have a range of frequencies, say it's, uh, you know, 50 megahertz wide, you'd be wanting to put it that right in the middle is what the wireless uh, transmitters are uh, designing these as. And we also have uh, directional antennas. So uh, some common directional antennas that we'll see is a helical antenna, which is a, a big spiral uh, on, a, on, a, on the end of a circle. Uh, you'll kind of see those every now and then. Uh, the the one common one that I see a lot of and I use at my church is a, a log periodic. It's correctly called a logarithmic periodic dipole antenna, also called a log periodic paddle antenna or an LPDA antenna. Um, and these antennas look like this. This is a uh, PCB board version. Um, they are a very wide bandwidth, so they are sensitive over a very large spectrum. Uh, so this specific one ranges from 400 megahertz all the way up to 1,000 megahertz or 1 gigahertz. Um, and then also they have a very large amount of forward gain. So that means that it's kind of like a shotgun microphone where it's going to be picking up um, mostly all of its information directly in front of it, but it's going to be um, not picking up as much on the sides and the rear as, uh, say, an omnidirectional microphone would be. So um, I am going to show you guys the measurements here. Um, so this is how I was doing my measurements. We have a uh, 1K test tone coming out of a Behringer CT100 uh, going straight into a Shure SLX body pack, as you can see there on the left. I put some tape to keep the uh, antenna from flopping over. Uh, the tape did not affect the uh, adjustment or the uh, measurements at all, um, but it was to keep the antenna from flopping over. I wanted that to be perfect perfectly vertical. Uh, and the uh, measurements were done um, with an RF uh, Explorer, which is a handheld spectrum analyzer for radio frequency. And as you can see uh, on the right hand side is my receiver uh, set at 537.450 uh, and I am getting a full signal on there. Uh, the RF Explorer was plugged into my computer, and I took 200 samples um, and then averaged those readings for the measurements that I'm showing here today. So um, the original location of the wireless receivers uh, was directly underneath the soundboard in this rack, and you can see the um, vertical uh, quarter wave antennas that are sitting there on the right hand and left hand side of the rack. And you can see that it's very close to the rack mounting strip. Um, and then now I actually have another piece of rack um, equipment that's put directly on top of those receivers that is also metal. And metal is conductive, um, as we all know. And uh, metal also is uh, affects how radio frequency gets into antennas. So if you have an antenna that's right next to metal, it's going to change the way that it's receiving that. Um, and so, you know, it was near, these antennas were near a metal rack, and they were also behind a framed wall with conduit and electric um, going through it and wood and a bunch of stuff. And it's about a six, uh, six to eight inch thick wall. All right, so here is a measurement done with the quarter wave vertical in the original orientation. Now, one thing to note is the scale on the amplitude and the frequency over all of the different graphs that I took um, is the same. So when you're seeing something uh, raise or lower, um, it is still the same amplitude scale. So it's the actual data that's changing, not the graph size.
Um, and so we can see here that the top is at negative 74.5 dBm. Now dBm is a scale that's measured from zero being the highest down to negative numbers. Um, and so if a signal is a lesser number in dBm, that means it's closer to zero because we're in a negative scale, so it is louder. Okay, so we can see that we have negative 74.5 dBm, and we have a signal in the noise uh, decibel range of 40 uh, and a half. And so just by moving the antenna away from the rack um, and moving it into open space or away from everything uh, gained me 18 and a half decibels of gain. Um, so just by getting that one antenna away from the rack and moving it elsewhere gives me that extra 18 and a half decibels. So that can show you how much much that rack and how much that metal that's around that antenna is actually affecting that. And so now we're going to take a look at the log periodic. Um, and so the log periodic was uh, just mounted with this uh, archaic mount here. I've uh, recently changed this into something else now. Um, but here is the measurement from that. So we can see that we're now at negative 42.0 dBm. And my signal to noise uh, difference has gone up to 65 decibels now. And so here, let me show you the difference between these two. So here's the quarter wave in the original location. And here's the log periodic. So that's quite the difference between the two. Um, and it's impressive that I was able to get uh, a higher signal noise um, decibel range as well. And so by switching to the log periodic, we gained 32 and a half decibels of gain um, over the stock original location. And we increased our signal to noise uh, decibel range to um, up 24 and a half decibels. So now we're going to take a look at RF splitters. So this is the actual splitter that's going to be taking our signal from our antenna and splitting it off to the multiple antennas. So an output splitter is a passive device which accepts an input signal and delivers it to multiple output signals with specific phase and amplitude characteristics. Um, and so we can see here we have our RF in, matching section, capacitor, divider, a resistor, and our RF outs. So the block schematic of the two-way splitter consists of that. Now let's go ahead and look at the specific um, parts of this. So the matching section together with the capacitor performs uh, matching on all the ports. Um, and then we have our um, divider, which basically divides our signal into multiple parts. Uh, now this can be two, this can be three, this can be four outs, six outs, eight outs. There's multiple different types of outs. All of them have different characteristics. Uh, the resistor provides isolation between the outputs, and this is important, um, and that way we don't have uh, reflections coming back into receivers and stuff like that. Um, and then lastly, uh, the matching section and divider sections are usually made of magnetic cores or balance transformers. You can think of them as a lot of different ways. And so with splitting, so when we take that signal and we actually split it apart, we do get insertion loss, which is basically um, taking that dB amplitude and bringing it down. So when we take something uh, and split it in half, uh, so we, we're taking that one antenna and putting it out to two ports, we get a 3 dB loss. And if we have four ports, we get six, eight ports, we get 9 dB a loss, and so on and so forth. Now, remember, to get a negative D 3 dB, we have to lower the amplitude by half. And to get a positive 3 dB, we have to double the amplitude. Um, and so basically, when we're taking that signal and cutting it in half, half is going to one side, half is going to the other side as far as the amplitude goes. So that's why we get that 3 dB loss. So here is a Shure UA221 passive splitter. Uh, they quote this for being used uh, for pretty much all of the Shure uh, receivers. Uh, it has an RF frequency range of 10 to 1000 megahertz or 1 gigahertz. Uh, they have a quoted insertion loss of negative 2, which is interesting um, because it actually measures at negative 3, which uh, physics would, would say that negative 3 is the correct um, loss. Um, and so now notice we have a frequency range of 10 to 1000. Now that kind of looks a little bit familiar. Um, now <laughs> So here is a television coaxial splitter. So this is the type of thing that you would take your um, coax line from your wall, your TV provider, your satellite dish, you bring it into the top, and then you take it out to your three different TVs in your house or whatever like that. And so we notice on here 
that this has a frequency range of 5 to 1002 megahertz. And so these um, have very similar characteristics as far as the uh, frequency goes. Now most television coaxial splitters have that frequency range between 5 megahertz and 1000 megahertz. And that just so happens to be wider than our frequency range for our mics, which was 470 to 862 megahertz. So I w had the idea, well, gosh, if this coaxial splitter is working for televisions that are in the same frequency range as our wireless microphones, then this should work for wireless microphones. So I went ahead and did this whole study on this, and this is why I'm uh, presenting it to you guys. So here is the insides of the Shure UA221 passive splitter. And so we can notice that there's a capacitor, a little white chip, which is the matching section and divider. Uh, and then we also have two, uh, a resistor and one more capacitor. Um, and then this is the internals of a uh, very cheap um, coaxial splitter that I found. Um, and you can see the insides of that. Uh, very similar designs. Um, the uh, Shure has more surface mount, whereas this one has more windings with a toroid core and stuff like that. But let's go ahead and test these two and see kind of where we are at with our measurements. So um, I went ahead and plugged in the log periodic into the Shure UA221 and then the output of the splitter into the uh, RF Explorer uh, spectrum analyzer and went, went ahead and made my measurements. So we have um, uh, 47 and a half dBm. Um, and so here is the next one is going to be our um, com scope, uh, which is a two way splitter. And so we have negative 46 and a half. Um, so there's a little bit more loss with the uh, com scope, but it's quoted as negative three and a half dB loss, whereas the sure is quoted as negative two. So uh, very similar, very similar results with using these two. And um, I did need to uh, adapt um, the BNC, which is the out um, of the, sorry, the input of the Shure receivers. Uh, I did have to modify um, that with a, an adapter to make it go to the F connections with TVs used. Now, what if we wanted to have more outputs? Well, let's go back to our um, theoretical loss here. So say we wanted to have eight outputs. You know, we'd have a uh, insertion loss of nine decibels. And so to, uh, to really get eight outputs um, and to counteract that loss of nine decibels, we can use a signal amplifier um, to counteract that and bring that signal level back up to a unity or closer to unity. And so we call these an amplified uh, coaxial split that are also active is the word that a lot of the uh, manufacturers will use for RF distribution um, of our uh, wireless microphones. So on the left here, we have a four-way um, active splitter. And then on the right, we have an eight-way active splitter. Uh, the one on the left has a 4 dB uh, positive gain um, on the outputs. Uh, the one on the right is actually unity. And so here we go. Here is the measurement um, of the four-way. Um, and so we're showing a uh, 41, uh, negative 41 dBm on, the, on that one. And here we go. Here's the next, which is the eight-way, uh, which is a negative 45.5 dBm. Now, the one worry that I had is what happens if power fails to this during the middle of a service or in the middle of a show or something like that. And so, I mean, if power failed, then that means that little active uh, active um, amplifier inside isn't going to be doing that anymore. So I went ahead and measured that. So I disconnected uh, the power and left it uh, unplugged for about a minute. And then I went ahead and made my um, 200 sample um measurements. And so with the four-way, um, we had a negative 70 uh, dBm. And um, with the eight-way, uh, we actually had a higher, uh, which was interesting, which was negative 58, um, which is a pretty good signal amount. Um, I did notice on the right and the left side, we had a little bit of ghosting. Um, so there was a little bit of uh, interaction that was going on inside. But this is still going to be enough signal to be able to get you through a service if it did fail, which is interesting. So let's go ahead and compare the power loss to the original setup. So here is the Sure, UA221 uh, with the quarter wave verticals. And so the way that we had them on uh, in the rack is the um, 
Cordway verticals were mounted on the outsides, and then they went to a Shure UA221 in the back, and then into the Shure receivers. So the max DBM uh, was negative 72 and a half. And now let's look at the eight-way with the power loss, mind you. Uh, and so here it is with the power loss. So you can see that we still have a gain of a significant amount, um, even with the power loss happening. So um, comparing those two, we actually had a 16 and a half dB gain improvement, which really is bringing that antenna into the open space that we're seeing there. And also we had a signal uh, to noise um, improvement as well. Ah, yes, but what about impedance, Drew? Wireless microphones say that they use 50 ohm, and televisions use 75 ohm. So aren't you going to have more loss induced because of those splitters and because of using 75 ohm coax and 75 ohm connectors and stuff like that? Well, it's interesting. So when converting a 50 ohm feed into a 75 ohm feed or a 75 ohm feed into a 50 ohm feed, you will have loss due to the mismatch. And so it's an SWR, uh, which is standing wave uh, ratio. Um, and the maximum loss that you can have at this mismatch is negative 0.18 decibels. So yes, there is a loss. But the amount of loss that you have is so small that none of us would be able to tell. And so here's a graph uh, taken out of uh, the ARRL um, book, uh, which is um, a very big, very big book, uh, basically all on antenna theory and um, everything like that. It's a great book. Um, so the VW, VSWR from 75 ohm to a 50 ohm is one and a half uh, to one SWR. And um, so you can see on this graph that the line on the very bottom uh, left is, uh, we can see that it's less than um, two tenths of a decibel of loss. Now, uh, there's a very, very, very smart guy named Jin Brown, and you can search him up on Google if you wanted to research more about the math, um, if you don't believe me. So go check him out if you don't believe my math, but it's, uh, it's really interesting. So the last thing that we're going to talk about here is the final product, so the final installation at Northridge. So I have one rack beneath the soundboard, and it has six of my wireless receivers. You can see on the left-hand side of the photo that I have two of the eight-way splitters. Uh, both of them are the eight-way unity gain splitters, and one is just an older model than the other. I have two antennas up top that feed this, uh, and so the top one is one side of the dual diversity, and the bottom one is the other side of the dual diversity uh, received. So I have the six uh, receivers in this rack here, and then I have one receiver up top next to my soundboard, which is the pastor microphone uh, receiver. So I actually have one more spot available uh, in this system here. And here is my uh, receive antennas uh, on the outside of this. The center antenna is actually my in-ear transmitting antenna for uh, the in-ear monitors for the musicians. So you can see that the antennas are sitting out at a 45 degree angle um, from each other. So one of the antennas is the A side, one of the antennas is the B side. Now, um, they sit out at a 45 degree angle to help um, with the dual diversity. If both of the antennas were sitting vertical, uh, if you had your transmitter in a horizontal orientation, you would actually receive a little bit less amplitude at the receiver. Uh, but by having both of the antennas at a 45 degree angle, instead of being the same vertical orientation, uh, the receiver will be able to pick up the best antenna for uh, picking up the receiver, picking up the transmitter, sorry. So here's another photo of the, of the contraption that I have. Now the center antenna is my in-ear transmitting antenna. Uh, I do have a uh, combiner, a power combiner is what it's called. It's basically a RF splitter in a backwards sense. So I have um, eight way um, that I can bring into this. So I can have up to eight different in-ear transmitters coming into this. And then the top is what goes off to the antenna. And so this combines the uh, signals of all of the different in-ear transmitters into one antenna. Here's a photo of the inside.
Now we have five in-ear transmitters, uh, so I just use the five. Uh, I do have terminators now where the green caps are. Um, if you didn't have terminators there, it's 50 ohm terminators. If you didn't have that, it would uh, it would play a little bit. Uh, you'd actually have a little bit different loss um, inside of the uh, combiner. And here is the picture of the overall thing. And so we started uh, this system looking like this with the uh, in-ear transmitter antennas sitting there, with the uh, receiving antennas sitting there, and now it looks like this. And finally, we come to the cost uh, and materials of the entire thing. So I will post a link of what the power combiner was for the in-ear transmitters. Um, if you have any questions on that, feel free to ask. Uh, here is the um, breakdown of what we used for the RF distribution. So we have two of the eight-way splitters. There are the PCT um, unity gain ones. Uh, those were $21 each. I have two of the log periodic antennas. To purchase those, you can search in Google Whiskey Alpha 5 Victor Juliet Bravo, the WA5VJB. Um, go search that up in Google and type in antenna, and you'll come right up to it. Uh, you will need to be a, an SMA connector to um, install on that. Sometimes he ships them with uh, the antennas if he has them in stock. Um, so next, you will need two SMA to BNC adapter cables. Um, those are $10 each. You can find them on eBay. Um, you need BNC compression connectors for the RG6 uh, or RG6 quad, depending on which one you decide to use. Um, and that is going to be for the side that plugs into the uh, receivers. Um, those come in packs of 10, and they're $21 for the pack. Uh, you can find those on Amazon. Uh, also, you can find the uh, RG6 uh, F connectors um, on Amazon. It was $6. Um, I think there was 20 connectors or something like that in that one. Uh, you need a compression connector tool, which you can also purchase on Amazon. That was about 20 bucks, And then coax, which was $20, about 50 feet of it. Uh, so my total cost on this uh, project was $206. Uh, now, to put this into perspective uh, for the uh, budget minds of a churchgoer, uh, to compare this to a factory antenna and power distribution, um, the closest one that I could get uh, that would have eight receivers, there was one that had seven, um, but this receiver uh, package that B&H sells has uh, up to 12 receivers. So it's three of the sure four-way um, four-way distribution systems with two paddle antennas, uh, and it was $2,052. Now, the only con of the DIY uh, side of things is, A, you're doing it yourself. Uh, B, you know, there's a little bit more work that you actually have to put into it. Um, C, you have to explain yourself whenever you have a professional come in and, and check it out, and then you get to have a really fun conversation and kind of spread the knowledge of this. Um, but the, the one big um, con is there's no power distribution. Uh, so you do have to have all, you know, all of your receivers plugged in with the giant wall warts. Um, and the, the sure wall warts are quite large. So that is one big con of doing the DIY system. You know, the sure factory systems that they sell have very nice power distribution where uh, it's all built into the rack mount thing and you just connect one small cable uh, between the distribution and your receiver. So, uh, thank you for watching this. I know this went a little bit longer than I'm sure you guys expected it to be. I'm a little bit long-winded when I'm talking anyway. Um, but if you guys have any questions, feel free to post below. Um, it will take me a little bit of time to get back to you as I'm kind of busy. Um, but I wanted to thank you for spending the time and looking at this. Um, you know, all of these um, all these measurements are done just as if the receiver was receiving it. Uh, so you, I mean, this is hard numbers, and I did very a lot a lot of testing on this. So I I have been using um, all of this at the church for the last uh, year and a half, um, and I haven't had any issues uh, whatsoever with uh, with these systems and doing this. So uh, it's a really good way of getting a RF distribution going in your system for uh, not very expensive. 
Thank you.